Hey guys, it's Cameron from Fear the Walking Dead, Season 3, Episode 5, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame. And I was definitely looking forward to this episode. Like I said, I've really been enjoying the season so far. I think it's just been really well done. And, um, you know, they did a really good job, um, you know, they've been doing a really good job with keeping the story interesting and just giving us some really nice, fresh dynamics, and this episode was good. I, I didn't think this was a bad episode. It wasn't great. I don't think it was up to par with the first four episodes, but it still was really solid. I still really did like what we got here. It's just... It does seem like the show is starting to get a little too overcomplicated when it comes to the amount of threats on this show. Uh, it just is getting a little too ridiculous, in my opinion. There were some things here that I really was not a huge fan of, but I still really did enjoy this episode. There were still some things that were really solid, but let's just get into it regardless, because I really do want to talk about this one. So we start off, we see this older couple dancing as the wife had to actually turned to a walker, and the husband's hugging his wife Martha as he lifts a gun to his temple and kills them both, basically because he just couldn't bear, um seeing his wife live, and their lamp falls to the ground, causing this fire, and I didn't really understand the point of this scene. I mean, to me, it just, I don't really know what this is really supposed to symbolize. The only thing I could think of was Travis, but Travis is dead, of course, so I don't know why we really had this in the beginning. I didn't really understand what the point of this really was until a little bit later in the episode, then I kind of started to understand the point of it, but in general, I thought this was kind of a weird opening, um, but we then see Madison and Nick. They wake up to people yelling outside that there's actually a fire and basically that's what uh, the point of this is but Luciana wakes up saying she's going with Nick as Madison asks where Alicia is and Luciana is still adamant about leaving like she really does not want to be there at all she wants no part of this farm she just doesn't really trust them and the crowd then gathers as some of the men attempt to, pu to uh, put out the burning home and a little girl comments that the couples are dead now and Madison makes eye contact with the emotionless girl and Jeremiah tells them to let the house burn burn to save the water and Madison then tells one of the men on the search team that she's leaving with that she survived the wastelands without him so she knows what she's getting herself into and before their conversation gets any more heated Alicia and Nick then call her over and they discourage her from going but she tells him to take care of Lucy and make sure that she does feel safe and I like the way that she is getting on board with Lucy like obviously she didn't trust her at first but now that she sees how genuine their relationship is like she's completely fine with it and uh, I, I definitely you know enjoyed that here but Troy then honks the horn, and uh, here's my main thing with this episode. Troy, as a character, he was set up to kind of be, like, this hostile um, force, and it seemed like he was enough. Like, he was enough of an antagonistic force for this season, um, but I don't think they're going that direction with him after this episode. It seems like they're going in a different kind of direction, because we see him, he honks the horn, he tells Madison that she's teaming up with him, and she tells her kids not to worry about her, and the more they understand the family, the safer they will be, and as the team loads up in the truck, Troy tells Madison to sit up front, and basically we can see that he's going to try to have a talk with her and who knows actually what's going to happen but jake is then reading scripture while alicia's trying to get coffee for her brutal hangover because as we know she had a really rough uh you know she got really trashed the last day and she spills her coffee and the officer saying that she needs it more than him and as he walks away gretchen trimble then approaches her asking if she will join them later and alicia fears that she has had her fill or you know of alcohol and wheat she doesn't want any more of it because it's really having a, a lot large impact on her and Lucy then watches from the cabin when Nick returns with a tray full of food for her. She asks Nick what's wrong, and he shares that he's thinking about the fire and the old couple, and Lucy says it's sad but beautiful as they were together to the very end. And Lucy tells him it's time for them to go. She just doesn't feel like they should really be staying here anymore, and he says that she just isn't ready yet. And, you know, obviously she's still healing, and she tells him to not make her the excuse for them to stay. He reminds her that they cannot walk to Tijuana without a plan. She confronts him, feeling that he's actually afraid to leave his family and that you know she feels like he can't leave his family behind and she makes Nick promise that he won't force her to stay and he will leave with her and I like this. I like that Lucy's trying to get him to move on from his family because Nick shouldn't be forced to, you know, stay there. I mean, why shouldn't he be able to venture out and have his own life and things like that? I mean, that's what Lucy wants. She doesn't want to be with his family anymore, and uh, I, I really do like the direction this going. I think this is a very interesting plotline overall. I really am liking what they're doing there, and I like that, you know, one of the things I did like about this episode that Lucy actually is getting some really good stuff, so I actually did really like what they got, what we got here.
However, I have to say the most disappointing stuff in this episode, believe it or not, was that from Daniel and Strand. I really did love Daniel's storyline in the last episode, but this was not at all the direction I thought we were going with this character. We see they're sitting in the car watching walkers across the streets, and this part I'm fine because he wants Strand to drive through the walkers, but he doesn't want to damage his car, and Strand is very shocked and that Daniel would have, and basically we find out that Daniel literally left Lola unprotected at the dam, which I guess I can understand that because... Daniel just doesn't have any hope, but why are we marking Lola as a main character if she's only going to be in one episode? I, I don't understand this. It's extremely misleading. What is the point of having Lola as a main character? She's literally only been in one episode so far, but he reminds Strand that he said it would take a day to get to the hotel where Ophelia is held up, and Daniel says that Lola will manage his daughter needs him more than her, and of course, you know, what Strand is saying isn't is true. You know, he did in fact see Madison and Ophelia there. He just it's been a lot of days, and Strand tells him he needs to be prepared that Ophelia like had left the hotel, and Daniel says he will just ask Madison where she is if she left, and Strand then says that they need to have faith, and Daniel orders him to drive through the mob of walkers. So, Alicia then finds Jake in the house and apologizes for being so rude to him before. He says he was only telling her he was happy that she was there, and she said that she didn't know about the fire and those people, and she asked him if they will ever be normal again, talking about the pl all the plans she had made when they made sense, and... I really love this scene because we know Alicia, you know, she was into all this stuff, like arts and crafts and all that kind of stuff, but now she's kind of thinking, I mean, does this stuff really matter? Because they're in the apocalypse now, and, you know, it's not really about that anymore. It's about fending for yourself and making sure that you're still alive. And he stops her, asking if she's okay. She rushes up to him, kisses him, and when she backs away, he kisses her back, and it does seem like these two are actually going to be in a relationship, which I actually really do like for Alicia. I think, you know, she's had that time to grieve over Matt, and it's been for like two seasons now um but with all of that said and done i like that she actually does have you know jake i think it's a really solid relationship but troy then spots a turned over a prison van with walkers chained to it and some of the men tell him not to waste her time but when madison says that she's with him he explains they could potentially become a problem if they migrate towards the ranch and orders them out of the truck and he tells madison to put the gun away as it makes too much noise and hands her an axe and troy then asks uh, who timed that and said it's a beautiful thing so, Nick then wanders through the burnt remains. He finds a picture of the couple when they were actually young, and Alicia then dresses as Jake reveals that he was an artist, writer, until his father actually steered him towards law, we find out. Like, he didn't want to be, um, you know, a lawyer. He was more into writing and arts, you know, and, uh, artistry and basically you know he did this because he thought it'd be a better service for the cause and he hands her the book titled burning in water drowning in flames by charles bukowski uh which of course this episode is named after and she tells him that she used to love all that poetry and art but she just doesn't really see the point of it all and she hands the book back to him and it's it's really sad, honestly. Like, I really did feel bad for Alicia in this scene because, I mean, this is her passion. This is stuff she absolutely loved. And now she's just kind of feeling like it's kind of pointless. Now it's not really about, you know, having a future and things like that because, I mean, the world's gone to shit. And there's no reason to continue um, what she's been doing, which which sucks. I mean, honestly, I, I really did feel bad for Alicia in this scene. I think um, Alicia Dunham Carey, who, you know, did a, has always done a great job in the show, but this scene in general, you could just really tell the hopelessness in her voice. Like, she really is starting to realize, you know, that a lot of this world, it's, it's just different now, and a lot of this stuff doesn't really matter as much anymore, and it's sad to see, but in a world like that, at some point, you just kind of put that stuff aside and focus more on survival, and you can tell exactly that's what Alicia is doing here. So Nick has been busy cleaning the walls of the burnout house when Jeremiah comes in, revealing that this was originally his home, we find out, which was the only house on the property at first, and it had been there for centuries, and he shows him where Jake was actually born, saying that he built a big house, and he left Russ and Martha uh, live there instead, and he picks up a gun for the blackened floor, saying it's a beautiful thing, and he asks Nick if he knows who he is, sharing how Russ had this gun hang over his door, feeling every homeowner actually needs a gun, and he feels like it's essential, like you need to have a gun there, and I, I would agree, I mean, in a world like this, you need a gun, definitely, That that's something that's essential, and... 
He talks about addiction and how Russ was really the only one who believed in him. And he says if Nick is going to do this right, he will need Jeremiah's help. And it seems like they're setting up a lot of tension between these two. Like Nick wants to leave and Jeremiah is trying to steer him on the right path because he knows that Nick has addiction problems. So you can tell that Jeremiah is good intention here, but at the same time, Nick and Lucy are planning to leave, and I don't know if Jeremiah is going to let them do that, so I do really like the way they're saying this up here, but Madison, Troy, and the team then arrive at the helicopter crash site and finds it's actually gone, and Madison says that someone hauled away, and at the site, there's a big W in the dirt, and they find a bullet casing, and Troy says they obviously have retreated back to the outpost, and they need to go right now, and Madison reminds them that they're going after these people, not just for Charlie, but for Travis, too, because obviously, Obviously, these are the people who are responsible um, for the helicopter crash, and she's still making sure she does get vengeance for that. So Troy then continues to drive his heavy metal blares in the background. He asks her if she's ready for what comes next, that it'll be living and not dead, and at first, she's very silent, and uh, she reassures him that she will have a fight in her, but seeing where it happened is harder than she thought, and he tells her there's no point in dwelling on the deaths, and just keep going for an eye for an eye, and when Madison asks him if this is a game for him, he smiles and says, it's not a game, but it's actually his calling, like, this is something that he likes to do, like, this is, he's meant to do this stuff, which again, is just so fucked up, but... That's kind of what it is. He just loves um, to, you know, look at people who are dead and to check on their remains and things like that. It's just, it's really weird. And Daniel then tells Strand that he was spared from the fire, but he doesn't really know why, as he doesn't really have a room waiting for him in heaven. Like, what's the point of him being spared? And he thinks maybe it's the devil who wants him down on earth with Strand, because Strand's the one person that he really doesn't want to be with. And Strand then says that they have will reach the hotel before dark, and he left the hotel because he wanted to broker a deal with Dante. And Daniel then throws the keys him saying that he's always out for himself and I would agree with that I mean Strand's kind of always looked in what's his best interest rather than what's the group's best interest and I think that's kind of been his fatal flaw there but Jeremiah tells Nick that he isn't bad at fixing the house and Nick reveals that his father was actually a contractor and did renows in the house teaching him as he went and he told Nick that he had to make the house his own if he wants to happily live in it and Jeremiah tells me wants to he uh, gets to actually finish this house as there may be something in it for him so Nick's look, Nick looks over to Lucy, and after Jeremiah tells him that she's okay, he tells him that Lucy thinks the monsters are worse at the ranch than out in the wastelands, and Jeremiah actually encourages him to tell her to go, because she can't get right what happened, um, and asks Nick if he can, and... This did not seem like he was trying to help him. It seemed more like he was threatening him here. Like, um, like he was kind of outright threatening Nick and saying, like, look, if you go, then I'm not going to advocate for you and I'm not going to help you anymore. And, uh, the search team arrives at the house on one of the hillsides and they find clothes hanging on the line, but blood splattered on the wall. And on the side of the pickup truck, Troy follows the scent. He finds a pile of burning men. When they look up, they see an old man sitting on a chair with a crow on his shoulders, picking away at um at his wound and basically um you know he's just picking away and he's just repeating the same sentence over and over again Madison takes the hunter's knife from Troy mercifully he just kills the man right there which was crazy but he actually did that and you get the sense that this is just something that Troy's fine with doing remember it's like his hobby it's his passion he loves killing and uh, it's very fucked up but that's just kind of Troy's nature of it all so she says they need to go, but a man that appears saying that they just got there. And then this Native American says he's only defending his land, but Troy gets angry saying that he's dead now, and he tells Troy to lower his volume and put down their weapons, and he reveals that they're actually surrounded. And here's when we get to the part of the episode that I'm not as on board with. We meet this group of Indians, essentially, in this episode, and... It looks like we're getting sort of like a Cowboys versus Indians sort of thing, and I'm just not really into that. I feel Troy is enough of, you know, a worthy antagonist. We don't need these Indians here. It just feels a little bit too much to me, but basically... Madison tells Troy to give the ore to disarm, and he does, and Troy says he's going to kill them, but the man tells them that he wants their boots as he's going to take their weapons and vehicles too, and he tells Troy they're going to have to return to the land that they stole from, ordering them to abandon the ranch, and he tells him about sacrifice and says that if they don't leave the ranch, he will feed each and every one of them to the crows, and... 
Madison says that they need water, and if he wants his message delivered, that they will need water. And he tells her that she bought into a lost cause, but she says it became her cause when he shot down the helicopter, taking one of hers, and, you know, basically this group clearly is responsible for, um, you know, uh, um, Travis's death and things and such, but Alicia lays down in her cabin. Jake comes knocking, asking her to come with him so he can show her something. He reminds her there are shards of light to give them hope that the ranch was actually set up for a refugee, not for ends of time, and she's so bitter that he jokes that um, she sounds like his dad, and he reveals how his father taught them not to let the bleeding hearts fool you. Talking about the Indians and the Mexicans saying that they stole their lands, feeling this land was owed to them, and that they need to defend to protect it. That basically the Indians are going to try to take over their land and you know they have to do what they can to maintain order and Alicia says that maybe Jeremiah was right and he disagrees saying that he knows where that thinking goes and feels that they need something greater to live for things that they actually used to live for and Strand Daniel then arrive at the hotel Daniel tells him to drive in even though Strand feels that there's something wrong like it doesn't feel like ever all is right and Daniel's suspicious of Strand suggesting his daughter might actually not be inside at all and they exit the car and he orders Strand to stay close Strand begs him to wait for daylight, but he rings the bell asking Strand where Ophelia is, and as walkers approach, Strand admits that Ophelia actually left them. He left Alicia for dead, stole their truck, and she could be anywhere and alive, and he fights off the walkers only to run outside, and they watch as Daniel drives away, and Nick then brings Lucy up to the burnt remains, and she hates being surprised, but he shows her a blanket and candles on the floor with food. They lie together, staring at the stars, as Nick tells her that Russ actually met Martha when he was injured during the career. Korean War, and she was a nurse at the Army Hospital in Tokyo, and she nursed him back to health, and the day he left the hospital, he told her that he was going to marry her, and she said that she knows, and Lucy asked how Nick knows, and he reveals that, um... Jeremiah told him that this place could actually be great, and she watches him, but doesn't really tell him what she's thinking. It doesn't seem like she's exactly on board with this. Like, at least the way this is going, it does not seem like Lucy agrees with this at all. So, the men are then tired. Madison suggests that they just take a rest, and Troy says that there's no way, because they need to get back there before those men or the walkers get to the ranch first, because, I mean, it's kind of a power struggle right now, and Troy then orders Mike to pick his butt up. He wraps up his food and get moving, and Madison tells Troy being a leader is knowing when to stop, and I would agree with that. I mean, you can only be a leader for so long um, until you're just, you know, um, you know, and until you're basically, um, I, I can't think of the word right now. Um, I can't think of the word right now, but, you know, you're taking over everything. I just can't, I'm sorry, I just can't think of the word right now, but, um, Basically, you know, you're, you're only a leader for so long until you, you know, start um, kind of becoming, not the terrorist isn't the word, I can't think of the word right now, um, but I'll think of the word in a second, uh, but basically... I know it's really dummy, but basically he grabs her, he says that this is his mission and his men. She questions if it's his or uh, his father's, and she questions him about his strange fixation on Nick. And she asks if he wanted to be a mama's boy and that his mother was too cruel for that. And she reveals that she knows all he did for his mother and that she still hated him at the end of the day. And when Madison then asks, dictator, that's the word. You can only be a leader for so long until you're a dictator. That's essentially what I'm saying here. And basically, you know, she doesn't want Troy to leave sort of like a dictatorship and when Madison asks the men who feels that they should just rest up, everyone raises their hand. Troy says that he's the only one who knows the way back and that they better pick up their asses at first light because he will leave them all for the wasted. He walks away as the men all watch Madison, and as they're sleeping, Madison's woken by Troy's blade touching her throat. She tells him that he's better than this, like he's just ready to kill her. He's not gonna let someone else take over, and he struggles internally before he retreats. She holds her throat and notices one of the men actually witnessed it, but turns over not acknowledging anything like he asks like nothing actually happened so Nick then wakes up at the, the house he finds a note from Luciana and the team walks back to in their wrapped feet as Luciana continues to walk past the wall and it looks like she's leaving like Lucy actually is leaving she's not okay with staying here and she knows that Nick's not going to so she's just gonna leave and Alicia then stands at the edge of the cliff while Troy with Madison and his wide leads the men back home Alicia jumps off into the water below as Jeremiah comes to see Nick placing the gun he recovered and cleaned on the rock in front of Nick and the house and it seems that he has in fact gone through to him and that is the way this episode ends really great stuff 
stuff overall, but let's just get into this episode and where I think this is going to lead us into the rest of this half of the season. So overall, guys, like I said, I still really did enjoy this episode. There's a the few things that went down that I don't really like that much. Um... First of all, let's talk about this whole thing going on with um, the Indians, because I get it what they're trying to do. They're trying to make this like a Cowboys and Indians sort of situation, but in my opinion, I don't think we really need it. I, I really don't think we do. Uh, there's already so many power struggles going on with Madison and you know, with Otto, and then, you know, with, uh, you know, with Madison and Troy, and Troy not wanting Madison to take his place and make sure that he's maintaining order because he's so adamant on making sure of that, and, you know, his ways are just so brutal and vicious, but she wants things to be organized and things like that, and then, um, with Nick and um, Otto with him, you know, trying to help him out and give him advice, and Lucian is now leaving, that I don't feel we need these Indians in here. It just feels really overcrowded, and I, maybe they'll play a more organic role in the next several, you know, in the next several episodes, but right now, I don't really see the point of them. Why are they here? What's the need for these Indians? Why do we really have them, um, around in the show? I'm just not really seeing a point in it right now. And again, maybe I will later on, but right now I'm just not really seeing much of a point here. I don't think we needed these Indians in this season. Um, and I just feel like they're kind of out of place. I don't think they really need to be here, at least in my opinion. I could be, you know, um, I, I, I maybe at some point, uh, but it's just right now, I just don't think they really, um, need to be here, but that, again, that's just me, we'll have to see really, um, how that does turn out in the end, but other than that, guys, I did really like, um, what we did get here, I thought that the Troy and Madison stuff was really well done, you know, him not wanting her to take his place, and him literally, um, trying to kill her because she wants to, you know, um, change the violent ordeal that he's really created, and I think that definitely is very interesting. I think there's a lot of great tension here. Daniel Sharman is doing a really awesome job as this character. I, he's really impressing me, and I'm really liking what he's doing here. He definitely is really great. Um, the whole thing going on, like I said, with Nick and Otto, it's clear that Otto is getting into his head. Nick clearly is believing it, and it seems that Otto does want to help him, but it also seems like Otto is kind of molding him into the family, and Nick is clearly going along with it, and I hope this isn't the end of Luciana, because I really do like the thing that her and Nick do have. I think they have really nice chemistry overall, and I really did like her role in the show, but if this is their way of writing her out, I guess I can understand it. I can understand why they're writing her out. Maybe they just don't really know what to do with her anymore, but to that I say, why didn't you just kill her off then? Like, why do you need to just get rid of her like that? There's something to the walking dead seems to do a lot they just you know get rid of characters randomly and i get it they want to clean house a little bit but this is just not the way to do it i really hope this is not the end of, of uh luciana and based on what we've gone with daniel and ophelia i doubt this is the last we'll see her i think we're definitely going to see her again at some point and then as far as daniel and strand um the realization that daniel's coming to that ophelia might actually not be alive and that she actually may possibly be dead, I think is really interesting, and you gotta really feel bad for Daniel, because again, he feels like he very much is responsible for that, starting with, you know, the path he took, and all the lies that he didn't tell Griselda, and will feel about it. he still is feeling very guilty about it but he also doesn't really trust strand because strand's just not really looking for his best interest but at the same time you can't really blame strand because strand doesn't really know the whereabouts of you know the clark family or you know what's going on he doesn't even know about travis's death he knows about none of that stuff so you know strand is completely has kind of been left in the dust at this point and you really can't blame strand for this because it's not really his fault what I did really like was uh, Daniel leaving Lola. I just, I didn't really understand that because the episode ended with it seemed like Lola was the way that, you know, Lola was a person that was going to possibly give Daniel some faith back and get him back on a hopeful path. But now it seems like that's not the case at all. So I don't even know what the point of her character really was other than her saving him. I don't know why they just really got rid of her. So that again kind of did piss me off a little bit. Other than that, guys, I definitely did enjoy this episode. It was definitely a little bit messier than others. I really liked the Alicia and Jake stuff as well. I thought that stuff was really well done. I'm interested in getting more into that relationship. 
So this episode, like I said, some things I really did love. There were definitely things I liked more than things I didn't. It's just the Indians and stuff like that. I just don't know if they really do belong in this season, if they really do have a place here. And I don't know why Lola says the main character if she's just going to be in one episode. That makes literally no sense at all. But they did do the same thing with Alex last season, and I still don't understand why she was listed the main character when she was in two episodes. I don't understand that at all. Other than that, guys, I definitely did enjoy this episode. And I am going to give Fear the Walking Dead Season 3, Episode 5, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame, a B. So over, guys, for you for this episode of Fear the Walking Dead. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode overall. Left your thoughts in it. Guys, we only have um, three episodes left for this half of the season, which is pretty crazy. I know, again, I'm behind, but I am slowly catching up. And I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for Episode 6 of Fear the Walking Dead. And uh, I will see you guys for that. Also... Um, let me just give a quick thank you here to 22 Tiger Dude, who graciously, uh, made me this great TV intro that I've been using, um, which I very much do appreciate him for, you know, I didn't even ask him to do it, he literally went out of his way to make this intro for me, so I am very appreciative of that, I'm very happy that he did, in fact, do that, so... Thank you, to, thank you for that. Just things like that, I really do appreciate. You know, I've wanted an intro for a while now, so that's why you guys are seeing that. Of course, you know, he did, in fact, make that, so thank you for that. But that's in my review. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in my next video, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.